order. Questions to the Prime Minister. Yeah. Mr George Howarth. Question, yeah. Yeah. Question number one, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, tomorrow marks the one-year anniversary of the Westminster terrorist attack. It was a sick and depraved attack on the streets of our capital. But what I remember most is the exceptional bravery of our police and security services, who risked their lives to keep us safe. I know members will be attending the events tomorrow and over the weekend to mark this tragic anniversary. Mr Speaker, I'm sure the whole House will also wish to join me in expressing our sincere condolences to the family and friends of the Red Arrows engineer who tragically died in the aircraft incident at RAF Valley yesterday. I know members across the House also will wish to join me in congratulating Andrea Zafiraku, who recently won the Global Teacher Prize. It is a fitting tribute for everything she has done, and I look forward to meeting her shortly to congratulate her in person. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others, and in addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. George Howarth. Um, I'm sure, Mr Speaker, the whole House would want to be associated with both the condolences and congratulations that the Prime Minister has just expressed. Since 2010, Merseyside Police have lost 1,084 police officers. In 2017, crime in Knowsley went up by 18.5% and there were 21 firearm discharges, one of which resulted in a fatality. And across the force area, there were 94 firearm discharges with four fatalities. Local MPs have met Home Office ministers, but no extra resources have been provided. Will the Prime Minister arrange for the Home Secretary to meet with local MPs to discuss what additional support can be given to deal with this serious yeah, problem? Yeah. Yeah. Can I say to the uh, Honourable Gentleman, that in the Knowsley Safety Partnership with Merseyside Police, actually crime statistics in the constituency have fallen by 9% since the year ending June 2010. Since 2010. Since 2010. But I say to the Right Honourable Gentleman, he obviously mentions some incidents which are of real concern, uh, and I'm sure that the police are giving their full attention to those incidents. What we are doing is ensuring that overall, and he points at the Home Secretary, my right honourable friend, is ensuring that overall in the next year, not only are we protecting police budgets, but we will see with, with preset 450 million extra uh, pounds being available to police forces across the country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gareth Johnson. Yeah. I associate myself with the Prime Minister's uh, earlier comments. Mr Speaker, Britain's ability to trade with the world has been curtailed by the EU now for over 40 years. However, we have now won the ability to sign our own trade agreements around the world. Mr Speaker, does the Prime Minister agree with me that this is Brexit's greatest opportunity and ensures that we can embrace the globe as a truly proud international country once again. Yeah. Well, well, my honourable friend raises a very important point, and it is he is absolutely right, and I agree with him, that this is an important opportunity for the United Kingdom post-Brexit, because for the first time in 40 years we will be able to step out into the world and forge our own way by negotiating our own trade agreements and signing trade deals with old friends and new allies alike. And that, of course, we will be able to be doing that. As he knows, from next March, we will no longer be a member of the Member State of the European Union. And in due course, we'll be able to bring into force new trade arrangements around the rest of the world, a truly global Britain. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Thank you Mr Speaker. I, I, too, join the Prime Minister in commemorating the attacks that took place on, in Westminster a year ago, and I too will be at some of the events tomorrow. We should all remember this as an attack on democracy within our society. I also join the Prime Minister in sending condolences to the friends and family of the Red Arrows engineer who sadly died yesterday, and we wish the pilot well in his recovery. 
Um, Mr Speaker, I had the pleasure of meeting Andrea Zafariku, who has won this Global Teachers Award just before she went off to receive it, and I think we should all congratulate her and Alperton School in Brent for the great work that she does there. And Mr Speaker, today is the Kurdish New Year, Navroz. Can we wish all Kurdish people all around the world a happy, and particularly for those who are suffering so much in the conflict in Syria, a hope of peace in the year to come? Mr Speaker, does the Prime Minister believe the collapse of Northamptonshire Council is the result of Conservative incompetence at a local level, or is it Conservative incompetence at a national level? <laughs> answer. Can, I, uh, can, I first, can I first join the Right Honourable Gentleman in, uh, in wishing all those who are celebrating no ruse a very happy no ruse. Uh, and uh, if, we are looking at, if we are looking at what is happening uh, in relation to local councils, uh, obviously there has been the report into uh, Northamptonshire County Council, but let's just look at what we see across the board in councils. <laughs> If you, if you look at what is happening in councils up and down this country, there is one message for everybody, and that's that Conservative councils cost you less. Jeremy Corbyn! Mr Speaker, my question was actually quite specific yeah. to Northamptonshire. Yeah. And uh, the Tory leader of the council said, we've been warning the government from about 2013-14 we couldn't cope with the level of cuts we were facing. Yeah. And three years ago, Mr Speaker, that council bragged it was pioneering an easy council model. It then pr proceeded to outsource 96% of its council staff, transferred them to new service providers, run like private companies, paying dividends. Now, that council has gone bust. Does the Prime Minister really believe that the slash-and-burn model for local government is really a good one? Can I say to the right honourable gentleman, first of all, it would be helpful if he accurately re uh, reflected the independent statutory inspection which concluded last week, which was the report was clear that Northamptonshire's failure is not a case of underfunding. So his claims, his claims, indeed, North. Northamptonshire's core spending power is set to rise by £14.5 million. Pounds. So I say to the Right Honourable Gentleman, the attack that he is making, that this is all about the amount of money that government is providing, is not correct. What we are ensuring, what we are ensuring, what we are ensuring is that councils are able to provide good services up and down the country, and that is what we see with councils, uh, Conservative councils up and down the country costing people less, costing people less than Labour. Jeremy Corbyn! But the problem is that Northamptonshire has gone bust, and it is caused by the Conservative government and the Conservative council. And it's and it's a model, Mr Speaker, that is still being used by Barnet Borough Council, until very recently run by the Conservatives, they lost control of it this week, where, where Capita holds contracts with an estimated value of £500 million. What has Barnet done? Cut council staff every year and increase spending on consultants every year. Government cuts mean councils across England are facing a 5.8 billion funding gap by 2020. Yeah. So with hindsight, does the Prime Minister really believe it was right to prioritise tax cuts for the super rich and big business? Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, clearly Order, order, order. The House is becoming rather overexcited. I said a moment ago the Prime Minister's answer must be heard. The question from the Right Honourable Gentleman, the Leader of the Opposition, must also be heard, and it will be however long it takes. Mr Snell, you are behaving in a most undignified manner. Compose yourself, man. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, there seems to be a lot of concern amongst Conservative members about uh, my suggestion that the Government had prioritised tax cuts for the super-rich and big business and put it as something more important 
than funding for social care, libraries, repairing potholes, bin collection or street cleaning. Can I say to the right honourable gentleman, he talks about bin collection. Well, people living in Birmingham under a Labour-run council saw thousands of tonnes of waste on the streets because the council was failing to collect the bins. And we all know, he talks about payments, we all know he talks about tax. The top 1% of uh, taxpayers are paying the highest burden of tax than they ever paid under Labour. And we all know what Labour would mean for council taxpayers, because just this week the Shadow Communities Secretary backed... Oh, oh he says... Oh. because he doesn't want people to know what he's supporting. Because he has supported a plan to stop local tax pa- taxpayers having the right to stop tax hikes. He's supporting a plan to introduce a land value tax, a tax on your home and your garden. And he wants to introduce a new hotel tax. We all know what would happen under Labour. More taxes and ordinary working people would pay the price. Mr Speaker, the Shadow Secretary for Local Government supports councils, thinks they should be properly funded and doesn't think they should be a vehicle for privatisation. Mr Speaker, the leader of Surrey County Council, who is, happens to be a Conservative, said we're facing the most difficult financial crisis in our history. And he didn't mince his words. He went on to say the government cannot stand idly by while Rome burns. Council funding has been cut by half since 2010. Households in England, Mr Speaker, now face council tax rises of £1 billion. The Tory leader of the Local Government Association says councils will have to continue to cut back services or stop some altogether due to government cuts. So as people open their council tax bills, isn't it clear what the Conservative message is? Pay more to get less. Uh, The average council tax for band D property is £100 less under Conservative councils than it is under Labour. But he says says that his shadow local government secretary is supporting councils. I wonder if he's supporting these councils, Haringey, where the Labour leader was forced out. Brighton, where the Labour leader was forced out. Cornwall, where the Labour group leader was forced out. What, What have these people done? They had supported building more homes, providing good local services and tackling anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. So the message message is clear. If you believe in good local services, if you want to see more homes built and if you want to tackle anti-Semitism, there is no place for you in the Labour Party. Labour councils build houses, Conservative councils privatise. Mr. Order, 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 order. There's a very raucous atmosphere. I've said it before, I say it again. Backbench members should seek to imitate the zen like calm of the father of the house, who's an example to us all. Jeremy Corbyn. We all admire Zen, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> pay, pay more for less is what the Conservative message is. In Leicestershire, the County Council is pushing through £50 million worth of cuts yeah. and council increases, council tax increases of 6%. Their deputy leader blamed chronically low government funding. That's the Tory message. Pay more to get less. But it's not just households, Mr. Speaker. The average small shop will see their rates bill increase by £3,600. Empty shops suck the whole life out of our high streets and local communities. 
So why is the Prime Minister presiding over a government that is tearing the heart out of our local high streets? We've, surprised, we've provided extra support for smaller businesses in relation to business rates. Secondly, he talks about Labour councils building homes. Well, actually, we've built, uh, seen more council homes being built under this government than under 13 years of a Labour government. And he talks about what councillors are saying at local level. Well, I'm pleased to say that yesterday, two Labour councillors from Ashfield District Council What did one of them say? They said, both locally and nationally, the Labour Party has been taken over by the hard left, who are more interested in fighting internal ideological battles than standing up for the priorities of working men and women. Conservatives will always welcome people who care about their local area, and we will always stand up for people in their local area. Mr Speaker, Half a million businesses will see their rates rise this year, some by 500 per cent. Even Mary Portis, who led the government's Save the High Street campaign, said it was simply a PR campaign which looked like, hey, we're doing something, and hoped it might kick-start something. But it didn't. Mr Speaker, this Conservative government has slashed public services. They cut funding and expect councils to pick up the pieces. The result of this is children's centres are closing, schools are struggling, fewer police on the streets, older people being left without care or dignity, and refugees turning women away. The Tories' own head of local government says it's unsustainable. And doesn't it tell you everything you need to know? Doesn't it tell you everything you need to know about this government that it demands households and businesses pay more to get less? This uh, this government is spending more on our schools and our NHS than ever before. We're able to do that because of the balanced approach we take to our economy and because of the strong economy we see under the Conservatives. But I notice that the Right Honourable Gentleman, in his six questions, has not mentioned today's unemployment figures. Employment is at a joint record high. Unemployment hasn't been lower since 1975. Economic inactivity is at a record low. That's a strong jobs market. Who do I think benefits from a strong jobs market? Labour staffers, Labour council leaders and moderate Labour members of Parliament. Thank you, um, Mr Speaker. And I can only assume that the Leader of the Opposition hasn't read the report about Northamptonshire County Council. I'd commend it to him. But worldwide, I want to focus on a different issue today. (coughs) Worldwide, every minute, millions of throwaway paper coffee cups go to landfill. In order to solve it, we need industry, consumers and government to work together. And in that spirit, Amaray, a company in my constituency, have developed a fully recyclable um, alternative cup that can be easily recycled, unlike the current option. So will my right honourable friend join me in welcoming that innovation? And perhaps if she's around afterwards, I might be able to give one to her. I'm very happy to say to my honourable friend that if he'd like to come along and see me afterwards, I'm very happy to do that. Um, But he has raised an important point, and as he knows, we are committed to wanting to leave our environment in a better state than we found it. And I would like to congratulate Amare and welcome the innovation that they have shown. This is an important example of actually working with industry to ensure that we're dealing with this issue of uh, plastic waste. We're very clear, we were clear in our 25-year environment plan that's what we want to do, and Amare is a very good example of exactly that. Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And can I associate myself with the remarks of the Prime Minister about the terrorist atrocity in Westminster a year ago? Our thoughts are obviously with those that gave their lives and, of course, the work of the emergency services. And I want to associate myself with the remarks of the loss of the engineer. Mr Speaker, does the Prime Minister agree 
that subverting the democratic political process in any country is totally unacceptable. Well, we, we, uh, we certainly believe in uh, ensuring that democratic processes are able to continue, that people see free and fair elections. I think that's what everybody in this House would recognise and would accept. Mr Ian Blackford. I uh, thank the Prime Minister for that answer. Can I point out to her that the parent company of Cambridge Analytica is Strategic Communications Laboratories. It has been run by a chairman of Oxford Conservative Association. Its founding chairman was a former Conservative MP. A director appears to have donated over £700,000 to the Tory party. A former Conservative Party treasurer is a shareholder. We know about the links to the Conservative Party. They go on and on. Will the Prime Minister confirm to the House her governance connections to the company. Can I say, um, the Right Honourable Gentleman has been talking about two companies, about the parent company, SCL, and uh, he also referred to Cambridge Analytica. Uh, I can say him that, as far as I'm aware, the government has no current contracts with uh, Cambridge uh, Analytica or with uh, with the SCL group. What we have seen in Cambridge Analytica Uh, The allegations are clearly very concerning, and it is absolutely right that they should be properly investigated. It's right that the uh, Information Commissioner is doing exactly that, because people need to have confidence in how their personal data is being used. And I would expect Facebook, Cambridge Analytica and all organisations involved to comply fully with the investigation that's taking place. And I'm pleased to say, of course, that the bill we're bringing forward on data protection will strengthen legislation around data protection and give the ICO, the Information Commissioner uh, uh, Office, tougher powers to ensure organisations comply. And I would hope it will be supported from everybody across this House. We now have a lot of backbenchers' questions to get through. Mr Gordon Henderson. Uh, Mr Speaker, some London boroughs are renting houses in Kent, including Sittingbourne and Sheppey, for use as temporary accommodation for homeless families. My local authorities are then expected to provide those families with the support they need. This is putting a strain on Kent's schools, hospitals and social services, who receive no extra funding to provide that support. Would my right honourable friend agree with me that the London Mayor and London boroughs should be providing more homes in the capital so that London families can be looked after by them instead of placing the burden of care on hard-pressed council taxpayers in Kent. Well, can I say to my honourable friend that he's right to speak up on behalf of his constituents on this issue. Uh, London authorities must secure temporary accommodation within their own borough as far as is reasonably practical. But we've also changed the law so that council must take into account the impact that a change in location would have on a household. But he's absolutely right. We do want to see uh, the London Mayor and London uh, boroughs being able to build more homes. The London Mayor has had money provided to him to build affordable homes. It's a pity he hasn't been building as many as we would like to see. Even Morgan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. School cuts in Portsmouth under this government will reach 3.3 million by 2019. It means classrooms are being starved of resources they need, including textbooks and basic stationery. At the same time, approximately 40,000 children in the South East are relying on food banks. If the Prime Minister was a teacher who had been under a pay cap for eight years, what uh, what would she buy a struggling child in one of my city's classrooms? A textbook? or a square meal. What can I say to the honourable gentleman? Uh, He raises the issue of school funding. As I said earlier in response to the Leader of the Opposition, actually the uh, amount of money we're spending on schools is greater than it has ever been before. But we don't. But what, what matters what matters is the quality of education that is provided in schools. And that's why I'm sorry that he didn't welcome the fact that we now see over 20,000 children at a good or outstanding school in his area. That's 9,000 more than in 2010. Ah, quasi quarteng. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Now, we should all... Uh, recognise and uh, welcome the employment figures uh, announced today. I'm sure we all welcome that. But given the latest report uh, that there are unacceptably, still unacceptably high levels of youth uh, unemployment among ethnic communities in Britain, 
Uh, will my right honourable friend uh, explain to the House what the new £90 million pound fund uh, will do to help young people into work? Yeah. Well, my, my honourable friend raises a very important point, and of course we know these uh, figures because of the racial disparity or race disparity audit which I commissioned when I became Prime Minister. It does show there's been progress, but we do need to do more because uh, 16 to 24 year olds in other ethnic groups are twice as likely to be unemployed as their white peers. The £90 million that I've uh, announced will help tackle those inequalities in youth employment. It's an initiative that will be run by the Big Lottery Fund, and it's going to identify uh, the barriers to employment for those young people and then help them to overcome those those barriers. I think that's incredibly important, and I was very pleased to uh, visit Street League in Birmingham, which is already doing excellent work in this area. Mrs Louise Ellman. Um, Thank you, Mr Speaker. The war in Syria has now entered its eighth year. In recent weeks, over a thousand people have been killed in eastern Ghouta, and in Afrin, hundreds of Kurds lie dead, and 200,000 civilians are desperately fleeing for their lives. Even the hospital has been attacked. What will the government do to help bring urgent humanitarian relief for those in such despair? Can I say to the Honourable Lady that we take the situation in Eastern Ghouta uh, very seriously indeed. It's why it's an issue that has been raised uh, at the United Nations Security Council. My right honourable friend, the Foreign Secretary, has raised raised this issue with others as well. We need to ensure, we've been very clear about what uh, needed to happen to ensure that people could be um, protected, that humanitarian aid could get in, and that those for whom it was necessary uh, for them, because of their condition, to be able, given a safe passage to be able to do so, and we will continue to press this case. Shell Donnellan. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Yeah. We recently interviewed a panel of university vice chancellors on the Education Select Committee who failed to recognise that their salaries are outrageous, being twice that of the Prime Minister and mainly funded by the taxpayer and student debt. Given that these outrageous salaries are paid in even the poorest performing universities, will the Prime Minister confirm that this will be looked at in the post-18 education review? Yeah. Yeah. I say to my honourable friend, I think she's raised a, a point that others are concerned about as well. Of course, universities are autonomous from government, so it is up to them uh, what, uh, uh, how they set their pay of their vice-chancellors and what level they set it at. But they should recognise that students and taxpayers are all contributing to our higher education system and expect value for money. Um, The Office of Students, which has now been set up, will be acting to ensure greater transparency in relating to senior staff pay um, and requiring a justification for the total remuneration package that is awarded to the head of the provider and the provider's most senior staff. So we'll actually start now to see uh, a light being shone very clearly on the issue that my honourable friend raises. Drew Hendry. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Last week, The Agriculture and Fisheries Secretary, Anne Ruth Davidson, said, The Prime Minister has been clear. Britain will leave the CFP as of March 2019. Ah. Now, the UK is staying in the fisheries policy, but with no say say on quotas. The worst deal imaginable. What changed between last week and this week? say to the honourable gentleman that we will be working with the fishing industry, both fishermen and fish processors, to ensure that we do see a bright future for the fishing industry. And I want, I want to see few, three things. We will take back control of our waters. We will ensure that we do not see, uh, see British fishermen unfairly denied access to other waters and we want to rebuild our fishing industry. But that's a Conservative Party, that's a Conservative Party that is committed to coming out of the common fisheries policy. His party wants to stay in the common fisheries policy. Victoria Prentice. Mr Speaker, Charwell is really proud to be building three houses a day. Construction traffic is playing havoc with our road surfaces. Will the Prime Minister meet with me to discuss what more national government can do to help with inevitable growing pains? Well, can I first of, uh, first of all say to my honourable friend that I'm very happy to uh, congratulate Charwell for the homes that they are building, but I recognise that this brings with it, uh, brings with it other challenges. Uh, and 
At budget, we more than doubled the Housing Infrastructure Fund with another £2.7 billion. And earlier today, my right honourable friend, the Housing Secretary, I'm pleased to say, announced a further 44 areas shortlisted for funding for major infrastructure projects worth £4.1 billion, with the potential to deliver 400,000 more homes. So I recognise the important role that infrastructure plays. That's why the government is delivering. Sir David Crosby. The Prime Minister was right to prevent members of the royal family and government ministers from attending the Football World Cup in Russia. But what is being done to safeguard everyday football fans in what was, in my view, already a dangerous place to watch football, even before the incident in Salisbury? What advice will be given to travelling English supporters? many of whom have already bought their tickets, and is she confident that adequate cooperation between our police and the Russian police will protect English fans? Well, I recognise the important issue that the Honourable Gentleman has raised, because we want British football fans to be able to be safe when they're enjoying watching the, uh, watching the England team. What, uh, we are currently working with the police, and the police are working very closely and looking at what arrangements will be in place to support the uh, England football fans who do travel to Russia, and the Foreign Office will be carefully monitoring the situation and ensuring that advice is available uh, to football fans so that they are aware of the circumstances that will be in Russia and what support will be available. This is Pauline Latham. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, my right honourable friend will be aware that I have mentioned Jackie Woodcock, uh, a terminally ill constituent of mine, who set up the Dying to Work campaign. Santander who are her mortgage brokers, have been incredibly helpful in freezing her payments and will take it from her estate when she dies. But now they've been even, gone even further. They're not increasing the interest payments either. Would my right honourable friend agree that other banks should follow the caring and compassionate example set by Santander and encourage them to look after terminally ill people in the same way? I say to, uh, to my honourable friend that she has raised an issue about which I know she cares about very deeply. And I'm certainly happy to join her in congratulating uh, Santander and the support that they have provided to Jackie Woodcock. Um, Obviously, she's raised a wider issue. I think it is important for employers to be aware of and fulfil their legal obligations towards their employees, including the terminally ill employees. And I'm sure that others will look at the excellent example that Santander has set. Ahmed Yassin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Sunday Times said this week that Bedford's relatively affordable housing and easy access to London has made it one of the best places to live in the UK. But Bedford constituents are worried about and concerned about the school funding cuts, court services cuts, the impending closure of our only walk-in centre, the big increase in homelessness, and the loss of fast peak time rail services to London. My question to the Prime Minister is why her government is ruining the prospects of our great town? I can say to the Honourable Gentleman that the prospects for his great town are being improved. They're being improved by the fact that we see thousands more children in good and outstanding schools uh, in Bedford than we have done in Bedford Local Authority than we have done before when we uh, came into power. Uh, It's being improved by the fact that extra funding is going into the health service in, uh, in Bedford. But it's also being improved by the fact that this is a government which is ensuring we have a strong economy, providing jobs for people in his constituency. Bim Afolami. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Financial services are of critical importance both to thousands of my constituents in Hitchin and Harpenden and also to the country as a whole. Would the Prime Minister take this opportunity to update the House on progress that has been made on ensuring that our future trade deal with the European Union includes an agreement on financial services? Can I, can I say to my honourable friend that I'm very well aware of the importance of financial services, uh, both for the United Kingdom, for constituents in uh, his constituency and elsewhere, but also the important role that the City of London plays in terms of the uh, financial sector for the whole of the European Union. Uh, this is a matter which we're in discussion with the European uh, Union about, and there is a, a, a recognition of the significant role the City of London plays and the importance of ensuring that we maintain access to finance across the European Union. 
Union. Lily Reeves. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mental health issues affect one in ten children who on average have to see their GP three times before a referral, with many waiting up to 18 months for treatment. I acknowledge the Green Paper on this issue, but at a time when national funding in this area is being constantly cut, including a 5% reduction in funding to Lewisham CAMs, is this not another example of the Government saying one thing but doing another with our NHS? I say to the Honourable Lady, the Government is putting more funding into mental health provision. We have already committed to making available an additional £1.4 billion to improve children and young people's mental health services, and we have committed that by 2020-21, 70,000 more children and young people each year will have access to high-quality NHS mental health care. Uh, and I just say this to the Honourable Lady. She rightly raises mental health as an issue that is important for us to deal with, particularly she's raised it particularly for children and young people. But across the board, we need to give more attention to mental health. We're putting more money into it. We're clear that we want to see parity of esteem between mental health and physical health in the National Health Service. This is something the Labour Party in 13 years of government failed to do. And marie Trevelyan. Published this week has sadly left my fishermen from Amble and the North East very anxious. Whilst we will regain control of our fishing grounds at the end of the implementation period, which is great news, there is real concern in case our EU colleagues try to take advantage of our losing our voice in the CFP by altering discard rules or changing quota rules during the implementation period. Please, would the Prime Minister consider asking DEFRA to prepare a financial mitigation plan to protect our fleet until we get to 21, should we need to do so? Can I, can I say to my honourable friend, that the agreement, the implementation period is there so that people can have the certainty of being able to operate on the same basis uh, until we reach the, uh, the new partnership that we're negotiating. As I said earlier, that new partnership, for me, we want to take back control of our waters, but ensure that British fishermen are not unfairly denied access to other waters. <laughs> And, and also ensure that we can rebuild our fishing industry, and I think that's important. What has been agreed, she mentioned quotas, what has been agreed is that the stability key will not be changed. So the, the quotas that British fishermen will be operating, operating under will not be changed. But I know that DEFRA are looking actively at how we can ensure that we're not only maintaining our fishing industry, but that we enhance and rebuild it after we leave. Liz Savile Roberts. This week, every party in Westminster took part in an international summit to challenge violence against women in politics. Online abuse dominated discussions. Last year, her government considered a statutory code of practice for social media corporations, holding them to account for the abusive content they publish. <coughs> Will the Prime Minister confirm whether she remains content with a toothless voluntary code? or whether she'll now give us a digital guard dog that both barks and bites. Yeah. Can I say to the Honourable Lady, she does raise an important point. Um, on all of these issues, we have taken the view that we sit down, first of all, with the industry. We work with them to see what they are willing to do on a voluntary basis. But they know that if that doesn't actually work, then we will look at legislation. But it's an important point, the abuse that, that uh, is undertaken. She referred particularly to abuse that takes place within political campaigning, which I'm afraid is a very sorry state of affairs that we've now reached in this country. We want to see the free and fair elections and people having the confidence to be able to go out and put their views forward without fearing they're going to be abused for it. Daniel Kaczynski. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The clinically led FutureFit programme uh, for Shropshire seeks to improve and modernise hospital services across the county of Shropshire. We have been waiting for a decision on this issue for many years. Could the Prime Minister use her good offices to ensure this vital scheme is supported in the coming weeks so we can secure this vital investment for Shropshire NHS? Well, my honourable friend is right to speak up for the NHS in Shropshire in the way that he has done, and he'll be pleased to hear that the uh, to see that the right honourable secretary, uh, my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care, heard his uh, comments, and I think we'll be contacting him about this issue. Nick Smith, Mr. Speaker, the Burko review made a big difference in improving services for children with communication needs. Communication is the key life skill for children to learn and to thrive. Yet a decade on, its latest report shows that much more needs to be done. So will the Prime Minister commit to a cross-government strategy 
that puts this issue at the heart of policy and gives all our children the best possible start in life. The Honourable Gentleman has raised a very important issue and we welcome the report and the Department for Education is going to be considering it carefully because we do not want to see any child held back from achieving their potential and that includes ensuring, uh, that includes ensuring those children with uh, speech, language and communication needs are given the support that they need. That there has been particular training for teachers to support uh, children who require additional help to communicate, but we will be introducing the education, health and care plans to make sure children with additional needs do receive the right support to succeed in school in the future, but we will look very carefully at what the report has said and obviously respond to it in due course. Mark Francois. Thank you very much, Mr yeah. Speaker. Yeah. Unlike the SNP, I do not want to see Britain rejoin the disastrous common fisheries yeah. policy. Yeah. But I do have some concerns about the fisheries aspects of the transitional agreement which has been provisionally agreed with the European Union. Before she travels to the European Council, can the Prime Minister reassure the House and indeed fishing communities around the United Kingdom that we will absolutely and unequivocally take back full control of our waters from 2021? Well, as I, as, I said in, as I said earlier, the, implement, the point about the implementation period is that it is the period during which people are able to move to make the changes necessary for the uh, new economic partnership that we will have. It ensures that uh, businesses, fishermen included, don't face two cliff edge changes in the, uh, in the way that they are operating. By definition, because it's uh, maintaining as far as possible the status quo so people don't have to make those extra changes, um, it, is, it is, I recognise, not the same as the and, and won't be the same as the end state when we uh, are able to have a future economic partnership and have those new that new relationship. As I said earlier, one of the elements that we will be looking for in, sh- in uh, reassuring the fishing industry and providing for the fishing industry is to ensure that we do take back control of our waters. Over Owen. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Can I associate myself with the Prime Minister, the leader of the opposition, and the leader of the uh, SNP? and offering condolences to the family of the RAF uh, engineer who was killed tragically in my constituency yesterday. The RAF has been part of my constituency for over 75 years and they are a tight-knit group of aircraftmen and support staff on the ground. And whilst they are grieving, will the Prime Minister join with me in paying tribute to the Royal Air Force whilst they commemorate their century of dedicated service to our country? I'm, I'm very happy to join the Honourable Gentleman in saying what a great job the Royal Air Force does for us. And of course, he sees it at first hand in its connection with his constituency. But we should, be, we should recognise the valour of our, all those who are serving in our armed forces, and particularly in this hundredth year of the Royal Air Force, those who serve in the Royal Air Force, and we thank them for it. Johnny Elphick. Mr. Speaker. Um, May I welcome the Government's decision to create a medical school at Canterbury in East Kent, fought for by all of Kent's MPs, particularly my honourable friend, the uh, member for Faversham and Mid-Kent, who has been indefatigable in the fight for this. Does it not underline the importance of training more doctors and nurses to ensure that our health services in the regions are well staffed uh, and well looked after? Well, my honourable friend is absolutely right, and I'm pleased to welcome the new medical school in Canterbury, but also the four other new medical schools that were being set up around the uh, around various parts of the country. And he is also absolutely right. This is about ensuring that we are training uh, a workforce for uh, our national health service, and we have uh, raised significantly the number of training places. I think it's the biggest increase in training places probably that the NHS has seen for some considerable time. Fiona Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Given that mesh can shrink, degrade or twist in a woman's body, can I ask the Prime Minister if she will support proposals to sling the mesh? Can I say to the Honourable Lady, I recognise that this is a very real, important issue that has been raised. It's one of a number of women's health issues that have been raised in this House, which are causing concern to uh, to women. And I will look in detail at it. I'm very happy to write to her about this, but I recognise the the concern that there is about this particular issue. But I'm happy to write to her about what the uh, National Health Service will be doing on it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Will my honourable friend congratulate the remarkable staff of Prince Alexandra Hospital in 
Harlow, who have ensured that the hospital is out of special measures today, um, as in a report from the Care Quality Commission. And will she support our campaign for a new hospital to ensure that the staff have a hospital that's fit for the 21st century? Well, can I, can I uh, congratulate uh, the, uh, the local hospital in Harlow that uh, my honourable friend has referred to for coming out of those special measures? I think that's very important and I know will give added confidence to his constituents. Um, he tempts me to support a new hospital in uh, his area. I'm sure, as he will know, the uh, Secretary of State has heard uh, his, uh, his uh, request in relation to that. But what we do know is we're putting more money into the National Health Service to ensure that we do get the best possible services provided to people through our National Health Service. Thank you. Order.